Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Michael Rothberg, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion of Mihaela Mihai's wonderful new book, Political Memory and the Aesthetics of Care, with respondents Allison Landsberg and Andrew Schapp. This event is sponsored by UCLA's Working Group in Memory Studies, and I want to thank my co-organizers in the group, Yair Agman, Rebecca Chai, and Sharon Zelnick. We want to recognize that those of us in Los Angeles are living and working on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva and Gabrielino peoples. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to reflect further on what it means to be implicated in settler colonialism during our next uh, book event, which will feature Kevin Bruniel's new book, uh, Settler Memory, the Disavowal of Indigeneity and the Politics of Race in the United States. That discussion will take place on Wednesday, April 27th at 2 p.m. Pacific time, and it's going to feature responses from Mishuana Goman and Hoesta Moehane, both from UCLA. Today, we will hear first from Mihaela Mihai, who will speak for about 15 minutes about her book. The two respondents will speak for seven to 10 minutes each, and then after we give Mihaela a chance to offer a short response, we will open the discussion to questions from the audience. And we're gonna ask you to use the chat function to write out your questions. And I will pass those questions along uh, to Mihaela. So let me now introduce today's speakers. Uh, Mihaela Mihai is a senior lecturer in political theory at the University of Edinburgh, where she works on questions of emotion, politics, art, memory, and gender at the intersection of political theory, political science, and cultural studies. She's the author of many articles in journals such as Angeliki, Constellations, Parallax, and Political Theory, and co-editor of three volumes on uh, political violence, democracy, and political apologies. Mihaela's first authored book was Negative Emotions and Transitional Justice, published in 2016 with Columbia University Press. The book that brings us together today uh, is Political Memory and the Aesthetics of Care, the Art of Complicity and Resistance, published this year by Stanford University Press. It's a lucid and compelling book about systemic violence and its afterlives, and it's one I'm really looking forward to talking about today with two terrific respondents. And our first respondent will be Alison Landsberg, who is a professor in the Department of History and Art History and director of the Center for Humanities Research at George Mason University, where she also teaches in the Cultural Studies PhD program. A specialist in visual culture, memory politics, and affect. She's the author of Prosthetic Memory, The Transformation of American Remembrance in the Age of Mass Culture, as well as Engaging History, Mass Culture, and the Production of Historical Knowledge, both published by Columbia. Our second respondent will be Andrew Schopp, who is Associate Professor of Politics at the University of Exeter, a specialist in contemporary political theory, with particular interests in Hannah Arendt, Jacques Ranciere, and radical democracy. He's the author of the books Political Reconciliation and Law and Agonistic Politics, as well as numerous essays in journals such as Contemporary Political Theory and Political Studies. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Mihaela and uh, welcome you all once more for this uh, discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for your kind introduction. Um, thank you for organizing um, the event um, and for your support for the project. And uh, many thanks also to Alison and Andy for their time and their effort. I really appreciate you taking uh, the time to do this. Uh, I'm also humbled to be uh, in the company of so many uh, of um, uh, for so many friends and colleagues who have uh, come to this event. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm really uh, chuffed to see so many familiar faces here in, in, in the virtual room. So thank you all. Um, today I'm going to present to you um, a, rather quickly and superficially um, the arguments of this uh, monograph, Political Memory and the Aesthetics of Care. Uh, and I'm going to uh, present it um, 
in um, first by giving you a bit of historical um, um, historical information about the project from which the book arrived. Um, the book was written as part of an ERC, European Research Council, a starting grant project that um, was held at the University of Edinburgh for five years, 2015-2020. Um, and the research questions the project was uh, focusing on were how do societies remember histories of systemic violence, who is excluded from their histories, cast of characters, and what are the political costs of these exclusions in the present? Typical questions in, um, in history, um, in political memory and in uh, historical injustice literatures. The project was interdisciplinary and it had several research objectives. The first was to um, investigate from a historical and sociological point of view, widespread complicity with political violence and resistance to it. Uh, we also wanted to look at how complicity and resistance were misremembered politically and to try to figure out by means of which uh, political media we could subvert, we could criticize uh, political memory, hegemonic political memory, and we focused in particular on artistic production. The case studies that we studied were Vichy France, Apartheid South Africa, Communist Romania, and the most recent military junta in Argentina. In the book, I only covered the three, um, the three first, um, the, the first three uh, case studies listed here. The author of the book on Argentina is actually in the room, uh, Mauro Greco. If you're interested, that's the book to read about Argentina. Um, now, the starting point, the theoretical starting point, uh, was a diagnostic analysis of what I call in the book a double erasure. And the first part of this double erasure covers widespread systematic complicity with political violence. And what I figured uh, in my analysis of how uh, complicity was uh, discussed uh, in public debates, but also in many, uh, many fields of the literature, in particular in moral and political philosophy, but also in certain areas of transitional justice, um, a, a legalistic, individualizing imaginary dominated accounts of complicity. Complicity was, understand, was understood uh, on an act-based, temporally static and punitively driven account. Um, scholars were focusing on acts of complicity that happened at a specific moment in time and the main driving impetus for analyzing it was either legal punishment or uh, moral judgment. And that made uh, invisible, resilient, historically rooted, temporally dynamic, and also sociologically differentiated patterns of complicity, not acts, but patterns of complicity. And this erasure of this structure and, and, and um, relationality of, of complicity, of course, had an absolving effect. But what interested me most in the book was the fact that in the name of clean slates or fresh starts, it allowed for the reproduction of violence genic or violence generating structures, forms of sociality, institutions, effective registers, norms, and so on and so forth. So the counter proposal I made in relation to this first erasure was to theorize the structural, relational, and temporally dynamic nature of complicity or if you will, its social granularity, the way in which it manifested itself socially uh, in patterns rather than acts. But also I wanted to recognize individuals' complex positionality at the intersection of multiple axes of identity. I wanted to recognize the social island from within which uh, they were entering the in-between space of involvement uh, and of implicatedness, uh, if I were to, to cite Michael's work. So that was the first uh, part of the erasure. The second part of the erasure had to do with the ways in which resistance regulatory ideal, which was heroic, exceptionalist, uh, usually masculinist, that consecrated the hero elect, uh, individualized merit and valor, and dominated discussions of resistance, both public, political and academic. And this meant that what I call impure resistances, which could not be subsumed to the heroic model, but also the hero's abuses, violence, gratuitous violence, moments of cowardice, moments of ambivalence, as well as the relationalities on which they depended uh, in order to act, all of these were occluded by, um, by the second erasure. And the effect of this second erasure uh, was an impoverishing of communities' political imagination as to what resistance could be, 
but also it was a sanctification of intangible, in intimidating heroes, often defined on gendered, racialized, and class lines, which made resistance, um, which made potential resist resistors uh, shy or uh, this this this. Uh, demobilized um, political resistance. If what it takes is a hero, many will be found wanting. So the counter proposal is to reject heroism's metaphysics of purity, to quote Alexis Shotwell's book, uh, a metaphysics that focuses on heroes' separability, exceptionality, their being outside and above their own community, and instead recuperate more credible, more tangible, and thereby potentially more inspiring resistors by individuals who do not fit the hero script. I also wanted to reveal the relationalities that underpin even the most exemplary resistors. Nobody is a sovereign, as the hero uh, elect script uh, tells us, and also problematize the underside of all resistance. Heroes' abuses, their violence, their ambiguities, their desires for a normal life, for a private and rewarding uh, life. And I will talk more about this in the Q&A if people are interested in this particular aspect. So this was the diagnostic part. The proposal, um, uh, the positive proposal advanced in the book was to, um, first of all, um, clarify that this erasure is not merely discursive. It doesn't happen only at the level of the symbolic, but it is also sedimented in institutions, in norms, in effective registers through political socialization. Um, to quote Serubavel, it is naturalized and reproduced across generation as a socio-mental topography of the past. So it is very important to think about this problem, not as a merely epistemic or symbolic problem, but one that has repercussions on the distribution of power, the distribution of burdens and privileges within a society. However, no mnemonic common sense, no official narrative is totalizing and counter narratives are always proposed by those within society who insist on the unforgettable. And of course, in all the case studies, uh, you can find activists, historians, sociologists, uh, members of victims associations, journalists who have historically articulated counter narratives. So what I, I did in the book is first, uh, building on insights from the philosophy and sociology of art, to theorize uh, um, artworks capacity to problematize the double erasure, to tease out the mechanisms through which artworks can problematize this double erasure. And secondly, to vindicate my theoretical proposal via several uh, case studies, the analysis of several case studies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Vichy France, Communi Communist Romania and Apartheid uh, South Africa. Now, what are these the what are these mechanisms through which uh, artworks can can subvert the double erasure um to begin with the book rejected both a romanticizing and unqualified trust in art's transformational potential when it comes to dominant hegemonic common senses but also a certain formalistic elitism that i think is easily associated with uh, the work of people like uh, adorno so what I try to argue is that certain artworks can sometimes seductively sabotage certain public's investments in the double erasure. Uh, that is to say, they can sabotage emotionally anchored habits of remembering that individuals internalize through processes of political socialization. And to do so, they need to trigger epistemic friction. This is a term coined by Jose Medina, uh, a friction that happens between, on the one hand, socialized automated memory, unreflected memory, and on the other, alternative accounts of the past. And artworks can potentially do this work of sabotage uh, by virtue of being uh, mediated, right? They are not about, um, uh, they are always fictionalized, they are about social types, not about specific uh, uh, fig figures in history. And also they have a pleasurable dimension. And this is key to understanding the seductive aspect of how artworks might trigger processes of mnemonic transformation. It has to do with the fact that they have a pleasure uh, dimension, a hedonic dimension. And in doing so, artworks enable a prosthetic world traveling. And here I build on Alison Landsberg's notion of prosthetic memory 
to argue that certain artworks can provide readers and spectators with a type of imperfect knowledge of experiences that they have never had. And it's imperfect, this knowledge is imperfect because it's fictionalized, uh, the stories, the narratives are fictionalized, and no full mastery can be obtained uh, through the aesthetic encounter with an artwork, not full mastery of, a, of, of history, of, of, of a past reality. I'm trying to change the slide. So that was the first the first theoretical part of the of the of the um, theoretical argument in in the book. The second part in the last theoretical move I make in the book is to build on certain strands of care ethics, those that allow for abstraction of care from the concrete space of the home or uh, welfare institutions into more abstract realms of human interaction, I, I rely on certain strands of care ethics to develop a conception of mnemonic care, care for the memory. And I read uh, the work by artists who trouble the mnemonic waters of their communities, who try to advance more complex, more honest, and therefore more uncomfortable narratives of both complicity and resistance, I read this risky labor as a labor of care for the space of meaning making uh, within a community's uh, public sphere. Um, this labor, I argue, presupposes certain virtues, thoughtfulness, in-depth knowledge of oneself as a carer, but also of the object of care, of the space of meaning and its erasure and occlusions. Um, it requires attention and it requires perseverance. Uh, it also requires um, attention to twin dangers um, that accompany the labor of care, that of rejection. Some of these workers were considered unpatriotic and some of them ended up in uh, exile. They were called nest fowlers. And the second uh, danger is that of contamination, of losing critical justice. This, this labor of um, mnemonic care has as its goal the eradication of what uh, Spivak called monocultures of the mind, reductive, simplistic, self-serving understandings of reality, of history, of past violence, uh, and making sure that the selective remembering of violence does not enable violent exclusionary patterns of behavior, habits of thought, norms, institutions to reproduce themselves over time. So this is the theoretical uh, proposal, mechanisms through which the official story and its erasures can be um, destabilized and reading the, the work of artists as a work of caring refusal, a caring, uh, uh, caring for memory. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the selection of, of the artists that I decided to engage with in depth. I selected both consecrated, award-winning um, authors, but also marginalized voices uh, in the hope of denting what I think are arbitrary international hierarchies of artistic value. Um, the field of uh, art uh, is a field of power with uh, hierarchies of value and with exclusions. And in choosing my authors, I tried to counteract some of these um, arbitrary hier hierarchies of value and, and exclusions and epistemic exclusions. Hmm? Sorry, we have a bit of trouble moving slides. Right, so the second part of the book is made of three case studies. Uh, I listed them before and they are symmetrical. They all have in a, uh, a first part um, a sociologically and historically grounded cartography of resistance and complicity. Uh, I relied very heavily on work by sociologists, by historians, by anthropologists to highlight the limits of individualizing and temporally static accounts of historical agency, both complicit and resistance. And I tried to show the relationality, the structural underpinnings of human action. I tried to show how gender, class, racialization, age, religion, profession, all of these came into play when it came to the patterns of complicity and patterns of resistance that we see in these um, case studies. Uh, in a second step, each of the empirical study, uh, empirical chapters uh, delineate the contours of the national official story, uh, tracing uh, it as it evolved over time and focusing in particular on the double erasure. And then in a third step, uh, I looked into um, artworks by caring refuseniks, trying to vindicate my uh, theoretical argument. Throughout, of course, I highlighted the commonalities that I could observe in the dy dynamics of both complicity and resistance as political phenomena, but also the specificities of each and every uh, context. And I'm very happy to outline them in the Q&A um, if anybody is interested. Um, now, um, 
just to, to say these are just uh, this is are just lists of the works that I analyze for each and every country. They are structured uh, according to some um, thematic criteria. Um, and as you can see, this is the list of works I analyzed in the case of France. You can find works by uh, Nobel Award winners, such as uh, Patrick Modiano, uh, and world famous directors like Louis Malle and uh, Alain Rosne, but also less known uh, authors like Jacques Laurent and Brigitte Friand, whose work has not been translated internationally. And I wanted to recuperate their labor of care because I think they have important things to say about the topic of my uh, research. Uh, in the case of Romania, again, you find um, Nobel Award winner Herta Müller and um, winners of international um, festival awards, um, Netzer at the Berlinale and Porumboyu at Cannes, but also authors and filmmakers um, who, whose work didn't travel internationally, uh, who, whose work is um, taught perhaps only in art school, but also uh, seen in cinematech uh, 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 all over all over the country, but that don't are not part of these international hierarchies of value. And last but not least, uh, in South Africa, um, you have a list of uh, authors here. My recuperative uh, uh, effort was perhaps strongest because uh, it tends to be the case that uh, academic and, and uh, public debates tend to focus on uh, South Africa's most famous uh, authors and, and writers. And here I'm thinking in, in particular uh, of Kutsia and Gordima. So I tried to, to level a little bit the play field and recuperate important voices from within South Africa who really tackled head on uh, the double erasure and provided prosthetic, seductive, uh, seductive visions into uh, the reality of complicity and resistance. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and I can't wait to um, hear your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mihaela, for leading us through the complexities of your book in such a, in such a fine way. And I will turn things over immediately to Alison for the first response. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to begin by thanking Michael Rothberg and the UCLA Memory Working Group and Memory Studies for inviting me, and even more for introducing me to Mihaela Mahai's new book, which was an absolute pleasure to read. It's such a generative text that I immediately added it to the schedule for the Memory and Difficult Past Reading Group at the Center for Humanities Research at George Mason University this semester. And it led to a productive and wide ranging discussion, in part, I think, um, due to its multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary nature, which makes it ambitious and, and super generative. I'd like to begin briefly by outlining what I see as some of the major contributions of this book. But mostly, I want to have a conversation with Mah Mihaela afterwards. So the second part of my comments will take the form of questions that I hope we'll be able to discuss. The move to de-individualize both complicity and resistance is a powerful intervention with both theoretical and practical implications. It effectively shifts the focus away from individual choice and morality to consider the powerful role played by social structures and systems of power. It opens up the possibility, as Mahai demonstrates in her careful analyses, of understanding the ways in which subjects are embedded in larger social fields. One's ability to act either as a caring refusenik or in complicity with a powerful regime is informed by one's positionality. We resist or are complicit for a range of reasons and in response to a range of pressures, and neither is pure. Mahai's use of Bourdieu's notion of habitus to articulate this embeddedness is particularly compelling. One's habitus, she describes, is unconscious second nature and as such grounds a practical sense. Connecting habitus to one's ability or inability to be a historical agent is a brilliant move and offers another frame for understanding an agent's positionality and the ways in which its contours are delimited. Her analysis reveals the way in which complicity and resistance are not opposing poles, but rather on a spectrum with one another. Complicity is pervasive and resistance impure. That we haven't recognized this, she suggests, has led to a double erasure, one which has radically impoverished political memory. As the texts in each of her case studies reveal, for most resistors, their actions are not simply the outgrowth of an ethical or moral code, 
though that may play a role, but rather are based on compli complicated, less wholesome and more expedient motivations. Importantly, her point is not that the impurity of the resistance ought to delegitimize it. In fact, she suggests that acknowledging the impurity of all resistance might make it seem more possible, even for those people who don't see themselves as heroic. Mahai's argument brings to mind Primo Levi's meditation on the gray zone, in which he warns against issuing hasty moral judgments about Jewish complicity at the death camps, pointing to the way in which moral responsibility lies within the system. What's interesting about Mahai's argument and the way that it's different from Levy's is that she considers the grayness that surrounds heroism as well, that it too operates in a gray area, and that morality isn't always the primary motivating factor for those who undertake heroic acts or join in resistance. Her analysis is attentive as well to the way in which gender, and in particular certain gendered narratives of resistance as masculine, have obscured the fundamental and essential forms of resistance that women have engaged in the, in the face of systemic violence. I think it's important to say that the book itself constitutes an act of mnemonic care, itself deepening and broadening the hermeneutic space of memory, introducing her readers to a vast archive of texts which artfully staged the complexities of resistance and complicity, and which for me was no small part of the pleasure of this book. Mahai's interest in the intersection of politics and aesthetics calls to, calls to mind for me the work of political theorist Jacques Ranciere. He argues that in any given society at any time, there is what he calls a distribution of the sensible. The distribution of the sensible then determines what seems self-evidently true, but also what is seeable and thinkable within a given society at a particular historical moment. We might even say, that Ranciere's notion of the distribution of the sensible maps onto Bourdieu's idea of habitus. Mahai makes a compelling case, as I noted before, for habitus as a way of understanding an agent's positionality, delimiting what is seeable and sayable. And for Ranciere, the aesthetic realm is of unique importance because he understands it to set the terms for what can be said and understood within a particular society at a particular historical moment. Aesthetics, as he defines it, is a delimitation of spaces and times of the visible and the invisible of speech and noise that simultaneously determines the place and the stakes of politics as a form of experience. Ranciere is thus claiming a privileged place for aesthetic innovation in the project of politics, as it is through aesthetic practices that new formal arrangements in the social world become visible and thinkable. Politics, as he understands it, requires an intervention into the distribution of the sensible. So perhaps Mahai's notion of seductive sabotage itself represents a kind of intervention into the distribution of the sensible. It produces hesitation, discomfort. For Mahai, seductive sabotage is a strategy by which texts lure readers or viewers into uncomfortable subject positions. The example of Turl from the rest of the supermarket has stayed with me. It's through this seduction that readers or viewers are led into intimate engagement with others' lives and experiences in ways that can be provocative, productive, and with political implications resulting from a mnemonic transformation. If our habitus creates second nature, it reduces our political imagination. Seductive sabotage emerges then as a strategy to disrupt the habitus, to provoke the imagination. The text Mahai analyzes catalyze new forms of thinking and understanding, whether in terms of epistemic friction or cognitive dissonance, experiences in the reader that might reboot political imagination. And this is where my work and hers align most closely, though I tend to focus on mass cultural texts and Mahai on art. And this leads to my first question. I'd like to ask you about your archive by way of a question about the category of art, which seems an important one to you. Um, you know, and you said again this morning, art can problematize the double erasure. How does the book's investment in the category of art, which is a privileged realm of cultural production and a form of cultural production that doesn't always enjoy wide circulation nor reach beyond nor reach broad audiences, sit with the book's significant and important investment in political work? Clearly, these texts perform a pedagogical function for the reader but can that translate into large scale memory work? If this kind of seductive sabotage happens only in those texts we designate as art, 
does that in some way end up limiting its political efficacy um, or potential? Second, you'll not be surprised that I want to talk about the metaphor of prosthesis as it appears in your text. You, su you suggest that you're interested in the way that novels and the, excuse me, in the way the novels and films you consider prosthetically enable an audience to see a world outside of their lived experience. This led me to wonder if all engagement with a text invites a prosthetic experience in your sense. Do all texts prosthetically enable viewers to see and feel things that they have not actually experienced in real life? What makes these cases prosthetic in a way different from other kinds of imaginative engagements that one has with a text? In, in my book, Prosthetic Memory, I was interested in how with the rise of mass culture, it became increasingly possible to take on memories of events through which one did not live. And I was interested in the specific modes of address enabled by audiovisual media and experiential museums that could powerfully position individuals to see as if through someone else's eyes. And I call these memories prosthetic, excuse me, I call the memories produced by the experience prosthetic memories, both to suggest that those memories might be useful in a way that a prosthesis is, helping us to see beyond the limits of our own positionality but also to call attention to the fact that those memories are not natural or essential, but worn on the body nonetheless, nonetheless, helping to shape one's politics or worldview and making possible political alliances across chasms of difference. So, so for me, the experience led to the taking on of a prosthetic memory. And so I'm wondering if, you know, in your analysis, if there is some kind of prosthetic object that's attached to the prosthetic experience, um, or if it's the artwork, it's that the artwork itself functions as a kind of prosthesis. And finally, I wanted to ask you about your investment in the notion of care. I very much appreciate your commitment to expanding the hermeneutical space of memory, to making space for dissenting memories that have been crowded out by hegemonic memory narratives. Contestation is clearly crucial to this model as you imagine it which reminds me again of Ranciere, for whom the essence of politics is not consensus, but rather its opposite, dissensus. So it seems to me that your interest in creating a space for dissonant memories as an act of mnemonic care shares Ranciere's investment in the, port, in the importance of dissensus for politics, which makes me wonder if the notion of care, which to me evokes a sense of community or even of the idea of doing something properly or correct, correctly, might be at odds with the dynamic and contestatory processes that you describe. So those are my thoughts. I, I absolutely love this book. Um, thank you so much for writing it. And I hope that we can um, talk a little bit about um, some of this um, in a bit. Thank you, Allison, for that response and for putting those great questions on the table. We will have a chance to come back to those in a few minutes, but first uh, turn things over to Andrew Schaub. Great, yeah, I'd just like to concur with what Alison said. It's a wonderful book, and I um, found it both thought-provoking about the stuff you're talking about, but also inspiring in the way it goes about uh, doing political theory, if that's what you're doing, uh, in, and the way it explores in particular what the subtitle of the book is, The Art of Complicity and Resistance. And I really like the subtitle um, because it captures this double meaning of art that's at play in the book. So on the one hand, we have the everyday political arts, the political arts of living, let's say, uh, under the regime, um, the arts of those who are complicit in and resistant to state violence um, within what Mihaela calls the spectrum of involvement, um, the range of uh, the in-between space between the uh, perpetrator and resistors. Um, and that's explored throughout the book in the three cases of apartheid South Africa, Vichy France and Trotsky's Romania. But then on the other hand, the art of the novelists and the filmmakers that she engages with and um, who she calls caring refuseniks who are engaged in what um, Mahalia calls mnemonic care work. Uh, and this is intended to interrupt and pluralise the dominant representations of complicity and refusal by successor regimes. So there's this double meaning of art throughout the book. And it, so there's kind of two levels that the book is always working on, both the representations of complicity and resistance, uh, that's been represented, but also the representors of those arts. Um, so that's a really, um, really great about the book. And you have to be on your toes to keep up with uh, moving between these two levels. And so I thought in the remarks, um, I wanted to say something uh, first about, again, similarly what's valuable in the conceptual framework 
that the book offers, and in particular, the cardinal concepts of double erasure, chapter one, um, the double erasure that official narratives of transitional justice presuppose. But then secondly, chapter two, the mnemonic care work of dissenting memory agents. And so these are the, the kind of gifts that we get from the book, the kind of ordering concepts um, in the book. But then chapters three to five explore these different cases. And in each, each chapter, as uh, Mahana was just saying, there's six kind of uh, works of art um, that we're looking at films and novels that she explores. Um, so it's quite dizzying the array of stuff and each interpretation is really rich in its own right. And so I wanted to give you a sense of two of those um, works of art and uh, Mahela's discussion of them. One is a uh, film, La Colme Lucienne, a French film about um, made in 74 about Vichy France and the other Nothing But The Truth by John Carney in 2008, which I went and watched because I thought, um, I didn't, I hadn't read or seen any of the stuff Mahela was talking about, and they were both brilliant films. So, thanks just for prompting me to watch them. Um, so, I'm going to be digging in and delving into more of the stuff you talk about in the book. Um, but I, I don't think I'm going to have time to do much of that. So, finally, then, yeah, to offer four invitations um, to Mahela to elaborate further on some of the subsidiary concepts. So, what's rich about the book is both the interpretation, but then the language that we get. Um, to use uh, that can easily be adopted and adapted and used in other contexts by researchers. So the subsidiary concepts I wanted to ask about were heroism, seductive, seductive sabotage, the good of hesitation, and the recuperation of the unassimilable. Um, so I'll come to those at the end. Um, so firstly, just to give a sense of what I take to be valuable in the book or the contribution um, in terms of these two key concepts, double erasure and mnemonic care. So with double erasure, it's really important to recognize the relationship between the erasure of pervasive complicity on the one hand and the erasure of impure resistance on the other, that's doubleness, if you like, um, in order to get the insightfulness of this concept, what holds them together. And I think this can be grasped most readily or you know, when I was reflecting on it for me uh, in terms of um, the ideological work that each erasure accomplishes uh, in terms of its temporal orientation, so on the one hand, there's a past-oriented and dissociative orientation. On the other, a future-oriented and associative orientation. So on the one hand, we've got the erasure of pervasive complicity, which dissociates a successive regime from the violence of the past, from state violence, by occluding um, the ideological and the material continuities between present and past. But this comes at the cost of recognising how the structural inequalities and the epistemic injustices of the past continue to shape and to be reproduced by contemporary agents and how the past continues to shape our perception of each other in the present in unreflexive ways. On the other hand, there's the erasure of impure resistance. And this legitimates the successor regime through its association with a heroic image of resistance in whose image it wants to envision the democratic future. But this comes at the cost of other visions, other collective visions of social alternatives in the present. And so in privileging um, what's really striking in the book, the masculinist and exceptional forms of resistance, it diminishes collective visions of impure political contestation and in doing so limits the scope of political imagination. So importantly, while this double erasure is sustained by official memory, Mahela emphasizes how and why it is reproduced through everyday social interaction or particularly interaction uh, among elites or those involved in cultural production. So it's broader than just the state. So while official memory shapes how individuals understand their present and future, it's also sustained, she says, by the cognitive, emotional and sensorial investments we have in the existing social order. And this is what Alison was just saying is really um, powerful in the book, the way this is uh, moves not just from what we think, but from what we feel and how, how, um, how the memory is embodied as well. And this is why our habits of perception are not easily shifted. They can't be shifted just by raising awareness. Um, due to widespread complicity in and benefits accrued from state violence through this spectrum of involvement, um, there's a need not to know about the space in between complicity and resistance that the book explores. And that's what's important about looking at this uh, positionality and relationality. And we can probably add in here too, um, you know, not needing to know and presuming to know on the part of different actors as well, um, which are forms of, as um, Mahela mentions, um, Medina talks about as how active ignorance is sustained. 
So um, Mihaila explores um, the controlling images and the master narratives of complicity and resistance that official memory relies on in order to anchor common sense. I like that idea that anchor, anchored in thoughts, feelings, and bodies of the people in of people in the present. So it's in this context that she emphasizes the important function of the caring refusenik, who could be a novelist or filmmaker or other artist, such explored in, in the book, but could equally include activists or scholars. And the caring refusenik engages in this notion of mnemonic care, which is intended to rupture the common sense of the past, present, and future of the political community, our habits of perception which the official memory seeks to entrench. And the point of mnemonic care is to generate this notion of epistemic friction, which opens the space for the self-questioning of a democratic community. So while official memory is presented as automatic, unreflexive, habitual, exclusionary, self-serving and reductionist, these are all Mahayla's terms, the mnemonic care work um, undertaken aims to interrupt, to destabilize, to suspend, to dent, to problematize, and to pluralize the common sense of the community. So you can hear, uh, I can see why Alison's thinking of Rancière here. There's this kind of politics and police kind of um, distinction being set up in some ways. But I don't think we need Rancière here to make sense of this, but it, it resonates with, you can see how it's a way to make sense of some of this stuff. So as Mahela's just discussed, um, much scholarship on transitional justice adopts the perspective of the state to consider how the legitimacy of a new democratic regime can be secured. So it's, it's how do we do it is the question that often uh, is in the forefront of this literature. And in contrast, I think the contribution of the book to the field of transitional justice is how the collective self-questioning that mnemonic care makes possible is itself fundamental to the new society, to a democratic society, even if it seems to conflict with this double imperative of the democratic state to dissociate itself from the violence of the past on the one hand and associate itself with the new society uh, based on those who resisted on the other. So I think I wanna to return to that point in, in the question of the good of hesitation in some sense, that's the point I wanna um, come back to. I was planning to put my timer on and I forgot to, so I'm just trying to keep track here. Um, yeah, so as I said, I really enjoyed watching these two films uh, and I would have loved to talk about, maybe we can come to that point, uh, La Combe, Lucy and, and Nothing But The Truth. Um, it's really striking, I guess, here I just wanted to, I, it would be nice to talk about some of the actual interpretations in the book because that's it's just often the, alongside this big picture that we get in the analysis, the more conceptual theoretical stuff, are the insights that are generated by engaging with particular contexts, particular thinkers and authors. Um, and here what comes out clearly in both is especially this gendered nature of both the representations of the past and the way in which um, gender is fundamental to the mnemonic devices through which, um, through which official narratives are sustained and which both films in different ways interrupt through exploring the familial relationships of the two um, protagonists. In the book, on the one hand, we've got this hyper-masculine traitor who upsets the norm of the you know, masculine association of masculinity with resistance. On the other hand, the ANC resistor who, um, who's died, who's in the background of the play, who appears irresponsible, who fails in his familial um, relationships and is left to depend on his brother, his caring brother to um, pick up the pieces. But maybe we can come to this uh, in the question. So yeah, so four invitations to elaborate, I could call them questions, but there's, um, just pick and pick what you're interested in responding to, Mahela. I wouldn't expect you to respond to it all now. But the first one was about heroism. And so I wondered there, so given the fact of generalized complicity that the book draws out so well, whether it's not still necessary, or in what sense it may still be necessary to memorize and valorize some form of exemplary resistance, if not heroic in the terms that you put it, uh, in order precisely to recognize the contingency of the violence of the past, that things could have been otherwise. Um, otherwise, you know, especially within the Bourgeoisian framework, it starts, it rightly highlights the difficulty of disrupting our habits of perception, but um, to avoid a kind of over-deterministic uh, account of the past. And I know in some of the interpretations you look at, that's some of the criticisms of the films that you look, that you get this kind of bleak view of France that uh, in the film um, about, about uh, Lucien, um, and even in the, the story, the brilliant uh, uh, play that you open with, the Ber Berenger's 
Berenger, the character in uh, Rhinoceros, you say he's a maladjusted, scruffy man, a social failure and a drunkard, and yet he's the guy that doesn't um, capitulate. So he's, he's unheroic on one sense, and yet he doesn't give in, he doesn't join in. Um, and I'm also thinking of um, Arendt, who we could think of Hannah Arendt in the Eichmann trial, we could think about as engaging in the same kind of process of caring as a caring refusenik. Um, but she mentions at one point in the trial, Anton Schmidt, who resisted, and she says precisely, just mentioning his name was enough to recognise that things could have been otherwise. The second thing kind of follows, but I think is a separate point about seductive sabotage. I'm really struck by the language because it sounds like resist, it's the seductive, the saboteur sounds like the resistor, doesn't it? And I'm sure that's um, deliberate, but the seductive, sabot seductive sabotage of the artist is happening sort of in the successor regime. They're sabotaging the script of the official narrative and also the language of the caring refusenik. Um, so they take on a kind of role as an epistemic hero in the book, um, but it's a hero, you know, it's, it's, in, it's in the, it's in post-transition, if you like. Um, and so um, I wondered a bit about how these two things relate to, to each other. <laughs> um, the resistance that's written about and the resistance in the presence, if you have any thoughts on that. But the one that I'm really most interested in is the good of hesitation. So that's the third point. Um, you say that hesitation, yeah, the good of hesitation comes in the second chapter. It's what the carrying refusenik brings off, if you like. So they may not succeed in challenging our common sense, but they might bring a moment, open a moment of deceleration, um, of a moment in which we pause rather than just reverting to our habits of perception, to our mnemonic devices. Um, and a way of recognising both with the limits of self-knowledge and knowledge about the political world. And this has the potential to produce epistemic friction, although probably clearly most of the time it won't <laughs> happen, but it's the, it's the possibility that's important. Um, and it has the possibility to disorient ideational, moral and experiential dispositions and undermine the needing not to know. So this is the idea of the epistemic friction. But I wondered about how this relates, I guess, on the one hand, this is the work of cultural production, the work of reflection. Um, we might say the life of the mind of, of, of philosophy. How does that relate to the other, you know, the, the time to have time to pause, to that other temporality that's so often used to justify state violence, the moment of um, action, the need to act, or elsewhere you've, you refer to this as the political urgency to mark a new beginning. So they're both political, but they're moving on different registers and in different, almost different temporalities of the kind of slow work of the cultural production and consumption that happens in the wake of state violence, but um, versus the need to act and to do something, to have policies, to make decisions and so on. Um, and then the final one was around recuperate, recuperating the unassimilable. So this comes very clearly in the final chapter on South Africa, as you say, where you define the unassimilable as events, actors, and voices that sit uneasily with the vision of the past fashioned through the double erasure. And the, the role of the caring refusenik now is it's, it's still obviously to bring the moment of hesitation, but also in some sense, a further demand to recuperate this unassimil unassimilable uh, in order to make marginalized social groups and actors audible and visible. So again, this is chiming with some of Alison's um, comments just now. And I guess I just wanted to ask how unassimilable is it or in what sense, what would assimilation, what would be the political effect of trying to assimilate the unassimilable? So I think you don't have something as strong in mind as the kind of some notion of the differon or something from Leotard. And yet you do want to insist on the difficulty of appropriating the unassimilable because of the the habitus because of the, the investments that we have in, in the existing social order. And I think what I like about the seductive sabotage idea is it's less um, dramatic than the dissensus, the idea of a dissensus or moments of political. It's an interruption, but it's one that, you know, how long does it take? How long is the event of this interruption? Um, and it's more oblique, I guess, than a direct challenge. So. I think it comes back to this idea of self-questioning that struck me as really what's brought about um, the democratic significance of this kind of work. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for putting uh, so much uh, also on the table as well as Allison. I'm gonna give uh, Mihaela uh, a few minutes to respond to those two responses. And in the meantime, I'm gonna invite uh, those in the audience uh, to uh, start uh, to formulate their, their own questions and to, and to type those into the chat, please. So, and we'll pick up on those after Mihaela. Thank you both so much. These are fabulous comments. And I think you um, made the arguments in my book much better by re-articulating them and, and translating them and, and building on them. And I'm really grateful for your interpretive, but also for your creative work, because I think your comments are actually very uh, creative and, and, and take what I did in the book much farther. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I'll try to pick on some of the things that that you um, you asked me about, um, Alison. Um, my category of art um, and and the tension that you saw between um, art as a specific field of cultural production that is classed and that is uh, limited in its reach uh, on the one hand, and my um, uh, trust in arts pedagogical or transformational work which cannot be on your account a mass impact right cannot be broadly uh, uh cannot be broad um, mnemonic work um, i'm not saying you can't i'm just saying that i'm asking you about this yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, I want to say that, you know, um, I'm a Bourdieuian through and through. And so I look at the art field and at artistic production um, as a field of power, which is ruled by certain conventions. And those who are socialized within those conventions have the capacity to receive and to be moved um, by, by, by exposure to certain artworks in ways that are transformational, that trigger hesitation, that uh, they are seduced by it, they buy into it, they're in the habit of receiving uh, artwork. So of course, uh, artistic production and artistic reception is class, is gendered, is racialized. However, when I looked at these, um, I want to I want to add why why we shouldn't think about art uh, merely in this um, uh, kind of a presumably elitist and 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 reduced way. Um, in selecting my case studies and in selecting the media, the the, the types of artworks I was going to uh, analyze, I was very careful to look at the historical traditions of literature and cinema in these countries and to look at patterns of national consumption of these media in in the three countries and I I also um, chose these countries because th at the moment when I was starting the project there was a fabulous uh, artistic production uh, about the about this history in all three countries uh, an artistic production that was also broadly consumed so I was very careful to look at um, um, and, and to select artworks in a variety of media that had rich and deep traditions within the countries I was studying, uh, media that are con consumed, media that are uh, that have a great prominence within the, the, the countries that I was looking at. Um, and I was also looking at, um, you know, when I was um, selecting the, the thinkers, another way to 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 um, explain why I don't want to. I, I think that while, of course, the, the 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 field of art is exclusionary there are always people who are pulling at the margins and reinventing the conventions that go govern this field in ways that make it more and more accessible to broader categories of of uh, of, of citizens and and, and broader publics um i also wanted to uh, specify that um th this question goes to the core of why i didn't go for these um the celebration of the avant-garde and the celebration of um, aesthetic formalism and uh, aesthetic innovations as politically transformative, exactly because I am aware that most of the time the kind of artworks that resonate or echo uh, publicly uh, are those that are generally um, uh, more accessible. And your work is a, is a, is a testimony to that. Um, and it's important to, to have um, um, it was important for me to have in the book a broad variety of artworks that work at various levels, various levels, and embrace various aesthetic choices um, in order to 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 make this to 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 engage in this political work that I wanted to um, tease out. 
um, prosthesis. I'm not 100% sure that I understood your question, but I think, yes, it is the artwork itself through processes of particularization, of exemplification, of illustration that actually perform this prosthetic function of enabling um, readers and viewers to travel imperfectly into the world uh, of complicity in the world of impure resistances and be uh, cognitively stimulated, be uh, morally stimulated in the sense that some of these works in, in, invite viewers to expand the scope of their sense of justice, um, of their ethical, uh, the space of, to expand their, their, the space of their ethical concern, but also sensorial. So there's a, there's a pleasurable um, element in, in this, uh, the consumption of these works that works beyond or underneath the cognitive radar of, of uh, most readers and, 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 um, and viewers. And I wanted this idea of the prosthesis to encompass cognitive, uh, emotional, moral, and sensorial elements. The prosthesis acts on these various registers in order to, um, uh, to um, transport, uh, transport readers and, and viewers in, a, in an alternative universe that looks different from what socialized memory um, tells them. Rancière, this is a question, I mean, I'm very glad that you picked on this and, and Andy has hinted at this. I am Yes, I am. I, I totally see the the, the Rancierian uh, reading, but I am so much closer to Bourdieu than to Ranciere, so that um, I think, of course, these I'm, I'm talking about disrupt disruption, but I'm not talking about disruption only at the level of logos, right? At the level of appearing and speaking out. Exactly because my understanding of prosthesis is also material, it's sensorial, it goes beyond logos, it goes beyond cognition, uh, it, it goes beyond uh, it, this conception of the habitus, I think it's much more, uh, it tells us how much more difficult it is to create rupture, right? And it is uh, difficult because these mnemonic doxas are embodied, are in, inscribed in the materiality of societies, are inscribed in their public spaces, in their institutions, in their symbolic space. So because of that, I think Rancière perhaps is not my best friend in this book. Um, uh, and, and it is to Bourdieu that I looked for, for most of my theoretical resources. Um, I know I haven't done justice to your rich questions, but in the interest of allowing other people to ask questions, I'm going to move on now to, to Andy's comments. And thank you so much for, for this um, associative dissociative force, which I think is, is quite, uh, sheds a lot of light on uh, what I was trying to do. And you said it better than I did. I, I found this very useful to, to think with. Um, Heroism, yes, I do think it is important to, to celebrate and commemorate um, exceptional uh, people who have taken exceptional uh, risks in order to uh, fight and in order to rescue and in order to save. Um, but I think that, you know, we can do that without falling into this individualistic exceptionalist script. And I think it's important to celebrate, but to celebrate with care and with nuance um, uh, because because as i said we need to have societies where an imaginary of resistance thrives beyond these exceptionalist models and so if we have resistors um, who are of course exceptional and who show the contingency of, of violence we can do so with attention to the relationalities that underpin them to their uh, with attention to the social island from within which they actually uh, uh, sprung into action and i don't think it's a diminishing of their merit or of their valor if we qualify and if we tell a more complex stories about um, these, um, um, these, these, uh, these individuals. Um, so at, at, at various points when I presented the argument in the book, people were talking about James Scott. I'm not doing that. I, that when I talk about impure resistance, I'm not talking about micro little things. I mean, of course, these are important for making lives livable, but I'm more interested in, in people who took serious physical and professional and, and um, uh, personal risks in order to, uh, to resist. And we need to remember them. Uh, without without transforming them into um, into saints and without erasing the kind of relationalities that enabled them to act to begin with. Uh, the question about hesitation and deceleration. Yes, this is a, a very important question. You're asking me about, yes, when is the time for hesitation and what is the time for action, if I were to try to 
um, re-articulate your question. And perhaps in, at, at the time of action, we don't have time for hesitation. And as you said, some of these works were uh, published later um, when people had the benefit of retrospect of looking back and trying to make sense of uh, what happened. Yes, of course, I do understand that. And actually, you know, in all of these countries that I studied, um, the time of action took precedence and very clear cut narratives were told about who the, uh, you know, the traitors were, who the perpetrators were and who are the victims and who are the saviors. Uh, and over time, hesitation, uh, the space for hesitation opened up after the immediate uh, moment of political pressure to make decision and, and, and move forward. But I think that even if we make this kind of temporal distinction between the time of action and the time of reflection, the time of judgment, of retroactive judgment and of hesitation, we have to admit the costs of the immediate actions. Yes, and um, I'm thinking of just to speak about France, right? The immediate action was wild purges, right? And wild purges of women and scapegoating, right? So even if we talk about the time of action, uh, we have to look retrospectively and judge that time of action and judge the, the, the violence that was claimed in the name of action, in the name of necessity, in the name of expediency at the time of action. I'm not sure I understood if I got your question right, but if I did, that's, I would, that's what I would say uh, top of my head. Um, the unassimilable. Um, da, 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 what? Yeah, what would be the effect of uh, assimilating the unassimilable? Or what would be the, the effect? I don't want to say uh, that we need to assimilate the unassimilable because the purpose of the unassimilable is to reconfigure the space of memory, not to make itself not to make massage itself into a story that's already truncated, but to help us tell more sophisticated stories, more complex stories, stories that enable us to reckon with, uh, you know, the fact that resistors engaged in gratuitous violence, that there was rampant rape in the training uh, uh, grounds of the NAC, ANC, that the fighters in the mountains in, in Romania were also many of them fascists or that, uh, you know, the, 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 the resistant fighters uh, in, in France after the war, they scapegoated women for their passivity uh, until 1945, right? So I think it's not a, a matter of making something unassimilable, ass assimilable, but of reconfiguring the very space of memory and the kind of stories that we tell about what happened. Um, I should stop here, I think. I could go on forever because these are such productive comments and I thank you so much, but perhaps you want to open up for... That's, yeah, that's great. No, that was already very rich and, uh, and questions are starting to come in, very interesting questions. So why don't I start with one of those? So this is a question um, from Nancy Sharma and it actually uh, kind of uh, connects to something I was also worrying about. So I'll pose the more general version and then ask her question, which is, how do your case studies relate to other potential case studies? In other words, as I was reading, I'm thinking you, you've, made a, you've made a good case for the sort of similar patterns that can be found in these three very different historical contexts. But, and then you offer a kind of theoretical framework, which is incredible, seems incredibly useful for a lot of different um, contexts. And I, I'm, so I'm just trying to pull out how your, how your framework might work for places where the double erasure isn't quite the same, you know, where you have different kinds of erasures, for example, or different kinds of political memories that don't follow the particular patterns there. And the question asks specifically about Turkey and asks if you could elaborate on the bit idea of collective amnesia present in Turkey in relation to the atrocities and violence committed against the minorities ever since the genesis of the modern Turkish Republic in 1923. Now, of course, you don't have to be a, an expert in every national context, but I think it gets at an important question, uh, which is about you know, other patterns of memory and how your framework might apply to them or how, they, how it might work there. Yes, thank you so much. This is such an important question. Um, and I think, you know, um, certain aspects of my theoretical argument, the ones that are pitched at the highest level of abstraction probably have a bigger coverage than the more specific uh, uh, kind of nitty gritty, more inductively developed aspects of my of my argument. I'm not a specialist on Turkey, but I think, you know, if I were to see, if I were to select the aspects that could potentially be uh, relevant would be a discussion of um, the ways in which memory is inevitably selective and that we need to critically think about uh, the 
the impact of a, of a certain cast of characters and a certain conception of historical agency on how um, on, on, on how certain patterns of exclusions are uh, reproduced over time in the present. I would probably try to say something about um, the analysis of the formal mechanisms of artworks and the idea of caring refusing probably has uh, some relevance for the Turkish case study. So I know from colleagues of mine who work on the Armenian genocide that there are artworks and there are uh, um, in various media that are trying to do exactly this kind of work of contestation of care for 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 the hermeneutical space of memory. Um, so, so basically what I would say is that um, depending on, on the, the type of erasures, different, different, um, different um, solutions will, be, will, will need to be articulated. But when it comes to the potential function of artworks uh, uh, in, in disrupting political occlusions, mnemonic occlusions, I would say perhaps um, the, the argument would, would work in a case like, uh, like Turkey. I am not uh, I'm not familiar with the specifics of the misremembering of all these atrocities. So that's why I can't possibly comment in more detail on on, on that case. Thanks. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I think I just I was I'm reminded of, for example, Atama Goyen's film Ararat would be an interesting, I think, case here because of its very self-reflexive, self-critical um, take on memory in a in a context of amnesia so just that's just to throw that out as a as i think something that would be productively read within your uh within your framework um we have we've been talking a lot about art um but there's a question also from moshtari hilal about social media and what role you might see social media um could play here given how powerful they have been in triggering epistemic friction and posing one of the most seductive uh, hedonic mediums at the moment. So this would in some ways get a little bit to Allison's question, I think also about sort of more mass forms of, of media. Yes. Um... I, first, I should say that not all seduction is the same, and although perhaps the mechanisms of seduction and the impact at the emotional, psychological, affective, sensorial levels are common, uh, could be common as, across several media, from cinema to um, uh, visual arts and perhaps, I don't know, social media, I think that um, I'm interested in, in a specific form of seduction that tracks a counter narrative and a narrative that will enable us to make more sophisticated judgments and more honest judgments about what happened. Um, and I am not sure that um, on social media we have the time and the space to articulate the kind of stories that are seductive in the way that I'm interested in. Um, I should confess in all, uh, you know, in all fairness, I'm not on any social media. Um, <laughs> well, I am a pro the project that that uh, funded this book was on social media, but it's over. So uh, I am skeptical about the kind of seductive uh, seduction that is possible within the space offered by something like Twitter. Uh, if what I'm interested in is a more nuanced, more sophisticated uh, uh, narrative. I don't think the social media is the place for nuance and for sophisticated narratives, uh, irrespective of how effective they are at seducing people one way or another. Does this help? Sure, thank you. I'm sure there's more to say, but we'll but uh, but we can keep going. There, there are new questions coming in. We've got. We can go another 20 minutes. Um, so I think there's still lots to talk about. I still have questions as well, but I'm gonna bring in one from Ariel Stambler, a member of our working group here, one of the founders, in fact, who's interested in uh, Al-Saji's idea of affective hesitation that you discuss in the book. I thought that was also uh, incredibly interesting and I need to look that up. And she says, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about how the new orientation toward mnemonic doxa generated by works of art could be made habitual rather than fleeting, right? Existing for longer than the length of interaction with the work of art, particularly given the durability and stability of the habitus. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's an important question. I think that connects in some ways to some of uh, Andy's comments about temporality and such. So how do you go beyond if, you know, I think your argument about the habitus is really powerful here and I'm finding that's extremely useful in my own thinking and have been have been thinking through it as well but how do you yeah how do you really disrupt that in a way that you establish new form new new, new kinds of habits i suppose it's very difficult to destabilize the habitus and it's very difficult to 
de reconfigure this, the habitus. Um, and many people have accused Bourdieu and his account of, of the very strong stability of, of the habitus for, of being deterministic. I don't think that he's as deterministic as many people have argued he is. And I think that there are within his um, theoretical work resources for imagining reconfigurations of the habitus. Um, but they will take a lot of time and they will take um, repeated exposures to, to stimuli that can trigger um, these forms of hesitation. Hesitation on its own cannot do the transformational work. It is an deceleration of the habitus, of automated habits of thought, of feeling, of behaving, of moving in space that hopefully hopefully uh, within that deceleration moment um, there is an opportunity to experience the friction between what one takes for granted one experiences as a practical sense uh, and an alternative way of being and seeing the world that comes from from the artwork one is exposed to so so this is the hope but to habituate hesitation um, uh, th th that is something that cannot be regimented or cannot be ensured. The hope is that once you are exposed to this counter narrative and you experience this moment of hesitation and your imagination and memory start to work in order to reconfigure um, your, your vision of, of, of history, uh, hopefully that will make you more open to being challenged in the future. But there's no guarantee and the moment of deceleration of hesitation can very quickly uh, close because the habitus is actually quite weighty. It's weighty on one's experience, weighs very heavily on one's experience um, and it takes, um, it takes quite a lot uh, and, and it takes a, a stupendous seductive experience and a, a fantastic prosthetic experience to even trigger this moment of, of um, hesitation that could potentially open up uh, the path to reconfiguring the habitus. Um, and so it's difficult to, to think about how we, you can, you can um, uh, habituate, you can make hesitation habitual. It's, it's, it's something that's fleeting and it's not capturable and it's not something that you can prescribe or regiment. Um, so that's why, you know, one of the things I wanted to say is that this is not a panacea, this is not a solution. I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that maybe sometimes for some people this is going to work. Uh, I don't want to pretend here that I'm giving you the, you know, silver bullet for for anything. Um, we, and we as theorists and as scholars have to resign ourselves to the to this fact that we cannot control reality and that theory cannot master reality. We just have to, you know, resign ourselves to the fact that we're making some little arguments and sometimes they will be vindicated, sometimes not. Is the, is the goal to establish a new habitus or is that a somewhat conservative is that a sort of conservative goal to begin with? I mean, what is the, you know, what would be, what, what are we aiming for, I suppose? Or is it to just instill a kind of uh, self-critical stance that never really settles into particular kind of common sense? I don't know. Well, the habitus is very much tied to a society's common sense, to a national common sense, like official histories are written and are taught and that is, you know, inscribed on on in textbooks, on statues, in museums everywhere. And so they they are um, they structure very much one's ima political imagination, one's ideas of who belongs to the nation, who is excluded from the nation, who the enemies are, who the allies are, historically speaking. And so it is very difficult to destabilize um, this, this vision of the nation that's internalized and it's embodied in, 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 in the citizen, right? The hope is yes to reconfigure to to reconfigure um, and to interrupt this this um, um, automatism of socialization and to interrupt it in a way that makes space for an alternative vision of the nation and perhaps a less intolerant vision of who the enemies are. Yeah, and and yes, it is about it is about reconfiguring the habitus. But an art can play a play in uh, can play a part in this process but it's not going to fix everything. There is a hope that it will work in the way that I discussed. Um, but because I'm a Bourdieuian, yeah, and not a Rancierian, I think that um, what we need is also a radical reconfiguration of our institutions, of our values, of our norms. Uh, and, and that takes much more than a couple of films and novels. <laughs> I have to admit that's true, even as a literary cultural critic. So thank you. Yes. So we have a question from uh, from Sharon Zelnick. Whoops, and another one just came in, but let me go back for a moment. 
Uh, Sharon asks, um, how does the how does mnemonic care shift when the artist belongs to multiple communities? And I don't know if that's clear. If not, maybe Sharon, you could you could jump in and 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 elaborate a little bit. Sure. I meant if they're living in diaspora, for example, and they create um, politically provocative art that addresses both the community that they currently live in and their home country or their country of origin. Yes, this is very important. Uh, Hertha Müller is one of the examples um, in, in the book. So she's she's a part of the German minority in Romania. She lived and uh, lived in Romania until 1986, I think, and she escaped just before communism collapsed. And so she's a German ethnic living in Romania who moved to Germany. And so she um, she's seen she was seen for very, very long time. Uh, as a, as a um, nest fowler, right? So by by the Romanian societies, they saw they saw her as this nest beshmutza in German, uh, as somebody who um, is is not a true patriot. Obviously, she's German ethnic, so she's not really Romanian, and so she's she's um, she's basically um, betraying the country in which she lived most of her life, and therefore she's un undesirable. Um, and then um, uh, and and of course her ethnic position made some of the, the the writings that she was proposing look illegitimate well what does she know she's from the german side what does she know right and she was she was the one who was always pushing this this point about the fact that you know they because of the duration of the regime most people co colluded one way or another because it was impossible to have a personal life or to have a personal uh, to have a professional success without colluding one way or another and she was making these points without um you know she was not interested in shaming people but she was just guys we have to reckon with this it happened because of the ways in which uh, this regime um, uh, functioned in our country but she was always rejected 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 and then she got the nobel award and then she got the nobel award for soiling the nation so again the point was uh well uh is she really romanian she, can we claim her and be proud of her or maybe she's just german who doesn't know anything and this is all political correctness and i don't know what so the intellect intelligentsia was very much uh hostile very much hostile uh to her it was very interesting to see however that there was a generational difference difference um, the old anti-communists who are also quite nationalist were, you know, calling her all these names and dis dismissing her value as a, as a writer. Whereas the new generation reacted much more positively to her work um, as it was validated by the Nobel and as, you know, people who had been born free were much more comfortable uh, with the stories that she was telling than people who were feeling kind of shamed by her work, even though that was not her, her intention. So yes, moving, being an exile or being part of a diaspora, this makes a very big uh, difference. And these dynamics of um, you know, being called a traitor or a nest uh, soiler and so on and so forth actually comes into play. And this is the most typical case I could speak of uh, in the um, in, in my selection. But I sorry, really quickly, this question links to a question that Alison asked and I, I forgot to answer care and um, doing this, this uh, and the tension and the resistance. Care is not care and love are not frictionless. Care and love are not without conflict and without tension. Um, care and love can be rejected. Care and love can lead to conflict. So the notion of care I'm trying to advance here is not um, uh, it's not free from all these aspects of complex relationships. So so that's that's what I wanted to yeah because I remember now. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got some more questions. We've still got a little bit of time. Uh, Jennifer Noji, another member of our working group, asks if you could say more about the potential risks or limits of representing impure resistances. Do you think uh, some instances of resistance, for example, those that might involve excessive amounts of violence, um, do not fit into your theoretical framework? Are there any artistic representations of resistance that you consciously chose not to discuss? Um, no, I'm trying to think. No, um, I the one work that I um, chose to discuss, which is quite um, might 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 cause some people to have ethical doubts. Uh, I did I didn't have doubts, but perhaps you know talking about this 
with you might make me change my mind. So there is this um, book, La Douleur, um, translated imperfectly and not fully in English as War, a Memoir by Marguerite Duras, mm -hmm. uh, where she basically writes a fictionalized autobiography. Um, and she points the readers to saying, this is me. By the way, at the beginning of the story, she says, this is me. It, it's a different fictional character with a different name, but actually this is me. And there is one uh, story which is called Albert de Capital. It's Albert from the Capital's bars, whatever, um, where basically she depicts with very explicitly a, a torture scene, a torture scene which um, um, has as the commander in chief of torture, a woman, a communist, right? So the, the, some of the most redoubtable anti-fascist uh, resistors in France were the communists. And this story tells the story of a woman communist who was part of the armed resistance, who tortures a traitor who had given some, um, some uh, villagers to the Gestapo. And this, this a scene of torture shows an absolutely gratuitous sign of, uh, a scene of violence committed by a woman, a woman who is a communist, right? And it is a violence that has no limit. It's a violence that is grounded in her absolute hatred. It's a violence that this woman commits while her husband is interned in a, in a concentration camp as a political dissident. And it's, it's a scene that is, one could on the first reading appear completely gratuitous and therefore unethical, yeah? But on, on a second level, and this is what I'm trying to argue, is that it shows the underside of resistance and it dents, you know, a, a certain ideal of communist resistance in two ways. First of all, by making the resistor a woman and by making her radically violent, by making her violent in a way that is not gender appropriate and not ideologically appropriate. Because after the war, the, the line of the Communist Party in France was we were the saviors without us, you would have done nothing. You know, we are the, you know, the army of shadows, right? The army of the heroes in the shadows armed with, uh, you know, berets and, and, and guns and, and uh, heroic, pure uh, saviors of the nation. Yeah, the, the return of virility in France, right? And in, in telling this story, she completely sabotages the script of the communists. And she does it, I think, in an interesting way. And, and because of that, I, I decided to include it and, and including, include this, this uh, graphic and, and less savory aspect of, of, of the resistance. Because it showed that even women who are part of this uh, sanitized resistance have committed, um, have committed uh, crimes in the name of necessity, in the name of, of um, war, where it's war, everything is permitted in war. But of course, these patterns of justification of violence, if unaddressed, uh, can be reproduced over time, right? And 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 can this this resort to necessity, to the to the language of necessity in the logic of war, can make violence quite easy, if not uh, if not addressed. So that's I don't know if that's exactly what your question was about, but that's one of the cases about which one could uh, raise some ethical concerns. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Now that was very interesting. I, I wanted to go back to one of Andy's points or questions, which is also something that, I don't know, puzzled me a little bit, or sometimes I found myself not entirely clear about, though your book is such, as I said at the beginning, a model of lucidity. Um, and it has to do with the, the sort of the moment of systemic violence, and then this post-transitional moment. Uh, what I call in my work, maybe the synchronic and the diachronic or the diachronic and the synchronic dimensions. So really it's, we're just talking about two different historical moments. And I guess I'm wondering about how you're thinking about the relationship between those two moments. Um, you know, what the, the sort of the moment of violence, the moment of memory in a certain sense, mm -hmm. if that, if that makes sense, I, I feel like that wasn't as always wasn't always as clearly elucidated as many of the other points and that you kind of move back and forth a bit between them. And they're clearly two very different moments. And as, as you were just saying in your last answer, of course, they are connected in, in important ways. And that's partly what you're getting at. But I wondered if you could just say a little bit about, yeah, these about that kind of, um, about that difference, synchronic, diachronic, or pre post transition, whatever the right words are. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, there are a lot of unsatisfactory um, answers to your fabulous questions today. Um, and this might be one again, but 
I, I'm mostly interested in how memory is narrated and remembered. Mm -hmm. um, and to do so, I did two things. First, I looked at sociological and historical work because um, there is now sufficient um, distance from, from the events themselves that we have new generations of, of historians who are less ideologically invested in um, in um, certain reductive narratives about what happened, who go into the archives and dig out and show, you know, these are the patterns. This is how, how resistance formed. This is when it formed. This is where the turning points were. And the same about complicity. Um, and so you have, you have this literature, which is quite um, uh, big, voluminous, fantastic. Um, but it's a literature that does not always uh, um, successfully shape public debates. And it is, I mean, there are some historians who have made extraordinary breakthroughs in, in challenging official memory. Paxton in France, for example, we can talk about that. And yeah. also th there are some in, in the other two cases. But I think because historic um, historical accounts lack this seductive, world traveling, prosthetic aspect, yeah, um, I think they cannot do the same political work that artworks can do. And here, I think I'm touching on some of the comments by Alison. Uh, I think that, yes, of course, a historical account will have a prosthetic uh, function, but its 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 capacity to seduce and to interrupt the working of the habitus is not on a par with a film or with with a novel um, where you are immersed in 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 particularity and you are immersed in in um, a rich account of a situation. There are some history books who do that, right? Some historians write history like they write novels, but I don't think that that's the norm. Yeah. And so um, I'm, I'm interested in this. Uh, the focus in the book is on the retrospective aspect. It's not on the actual moment of, of um, uh, violence. It's how it's recounted. But of course, I'm interested in what drove people to act in the way they did. And that's where the work of historians helps me, right? The work of historian tells me what happened in the moment of violence, why women behave, certain women who were Catholic and who were Petinist in France and who were pacifists colluded with the occupier and others who were communists didn't commun collude with the occupier, right? So it, it, I am interested in the act of violence in the sense that I'm interested in the social determinants of the act of violence. And I think that then I'm moving on to the retrospective judgment and looking at how the social determinants are erased and therefore um, certain meaningful conversations we could have about how we make violence less likely in the present are being lost because of the ways in which we remember the acts of violence. Acts. I, I, I'm having problems with remember, remembering acts. I have, I'm more happy to remember patterns of violent behavior. Okay, Does it make you. sense? Yeah, it does. No, absolutely. It does. And I think we're pretty much at time now. So I think this has been a really wonderful discussion, um, a great presentation of what's really a terrific book um, and two really um, thought provoking um, responses. Uh, so I'm really grateful to you, Mihaela Mihai, for, for your work and for being here with us. Um, to Allison and Andrew for uh, for their taking the time to formulate these really thoughtful responses, and being with us for this discussion. And uh, just remind you, we'll be meeting again in April to discuss Kevin Bernil's book on settler memory. Um, we hope to, uh, with everyone's agreement, to make this uh, recording available. I think it would be well worth it. Um, but thank you so much all for being with us today. It's been great.